we have here Candace from Heinz Hospice, Angel Babies. We have Lori from the County Behavioral Health um, Program. And we have Tamar, who is a licensed clinical social worker um, at a private practice. So I am going to let um, each of our speakers today kind of give them, um, introduce themselves, provide us a little bit more background, um, and then we will go ahead and dive into um, today's presentation. So Tamar, do you want to go first? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Tamar. Um, I work at Jan's Family Therapy, which is a private practice here in Fresno. Um, and I ended up working here because I'm a new mom. Um, I guess I can't say that, um, but really I am. Um, <laughs> so I, prior to becoming a mom, uh, worked uh, for the county and I worked in uh, predominantly uh, the dialectic, dialectical behavioral therapy um, modality, which then after having a kiddo myself, I saw the need of maternal wellness and how it was not addressed and how my journey through my own maternal wellness um, was kind of neglected and the way I was treated by medical providers and mm. just realizing the gap between um, the services and being like shocked and amazed um, that this is how it is. Um, and I guess you just don't know it until you go through it. And so that's what brought a lot of attention um, to my heart really in, in trying to help moms get a better understanding of what postpartum can potentially look like and to normalize that for them. Perfect. Thank you, Tamar. Um, Lori, do you want to go next? Sure. I'm Lori James. Um, I'm a clinical supervisor here at the Perinatal Wellness Center, which is a program of Fresno County Behavioral Health. Uh, we are in our 11th year. And um, our goal is to provide support to pregnant and postpartum moms and their families um, in a variety of ways um, through individual counseling, case management, uh, medication management, um, all of those things to, to help moms be the best mom that they can be. Thank you, Lori and Candice. Hi, everybody. My name is Candace Wilkins. I'm the manager here at the Heinz Hospice Center for Grief and Healing. The Center for Grief and Healing is a comprehensive grief support resource for our community. Um, and yes, we are providing support to our grieving families who are associated with Heinz Hospice, but we also have other programs um, that are available to anyone in the community who's grieving. We'll talk about angel babies a little bit later, but we do have our um, also our survivors of suicide loss program providing support in the community. So really happy to be here with all of you today. Perfect, thank you. So let's go ahead and we're gonna dive into what is maternal wellness as it relates to perinatal mental health. Um, and you guys can just do round robin. Um, so a lot of people, when they think of perinatal wellness, they think of postpartum depression, but as we know, maternal wellness is such a bigger topic than just that. Um, mm -hmm. So Tamara, Lori, um, do you wanna go ahead and just describe what that looks like, feels like for our mommies? Yeah, Laura, do you want to go ahead? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yeah. jump into my presentation afterwards. Okay, sure. So when you think about perinatal mental health, it's, it's really about being able to learn how to manage your emotions and your mental wellness while you're pregnant, not just postpartum, because your body's going through a lot of changes as a female. There's a lot of hormonal things going on. You can feel like your emotions are out of control at times, like you're anxious, you're depressed, you're crying, all these things are going on for no particular reason. And it can feel a little bit like, am I going crazy because I'm pregnant? And those are all important factors to consider. And it's great to be able to have support when you're going through that, not just as you know, um, someone who's maybe experiencing postpartum depression, but a perinatal mood and anxiety disorder that happens as a result of pregnancy, but it's not anything permanent, but it's simply related to your pregnancy. and. Mm -hmm. You know, in our area, about one in five moms experience this. And while not all of them seek support, I mean, it can vary in level of severity from something that's, you know, kind of mild and you just need a little extra support to something where you're, you know, you're, you're feeling, you know, all kinds of severe emotions. Maybe you don't even want to go out of your house. Maybe you, um, you don't want to open your curtains and see the sunshine. You just want to stay in bed all day. 
um, if you're postpartum, not even feeling like you bonded with your baby. So, you know, and even sometimes feeling like I shouldn't be here. I'm a bad mom. And I, I know I'm not a good enough mom for my baby. And I, I need to, you know, take my life or, or even take my baby's life. Unfortunately, we've never had that happen uh, with any of our, um, of our families or our women that have received services from us at the perinatal wellness center. But we do know that it does happen sometimes. And, you know, we want to be able to provide that support in the community as well as we can. Yes, thank you. And the great thing about our population of perinatal mental health, I feel like moms tend to want to get better, right? So they mm -hmm. typically seek out services, but they don't know where and how, right? Mm -hmm. So they're wanting it, but it's our job to kind of build that awareness component. Absolutely. Um, so tomorrow, I know we're going to talk more about dads, but do you just want to give a quick two-minute overview about how this impacts dads, Lori? Sure. Um, we also provide services to dads here, and what a lot of people aren't aware of is that men can experience what's called paternal postnatal depression. So it looks a little bit like postpartum, but it's very different, and it's not related to um, the same kinds of chemical changes and imbalances that are going on in a woman's body, you know, and it's not like something that's all in your head, that is a very real thing. And I mean, again, it can be uh, something mild, like, oh, I'm just not as interested in my work or having sex, or I just want to lay around and watch video games. I don't really feel like helping my wife with the baby, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and it can be as severe as feeling suicidal or homicidal and wanting to take out your family and yourself. And, you know, those, those are all warning signs that, yeah, maybe I should get some support for this. Maybe I should seek out somebody who can support me through this because I know I'm not myself right now. Thank you. Thank you. And I would just um, add to that when, you know, there's the baby is preterm birth or there's, you know, complications with the pregnancy or birth that just escalates the mental health. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. So Tamar, you're going to give us a presentation followed by Candace. Yes, absolutely. Um, and Ramona's not on, but she has access to my stuff. So um, Ramona, if you can hear me, um, <laughs> go ahead and present my slides now. <laughs> And she is the host, so I cannot make you co-host. Yeah. Hmm. There we go. Thanks. Thanks, Ramona. Um, so these slides are gonna kind of just, and I and I wanna um, open this up for conversation. There are just some statements on these um slides so i want to be able to see um you know laurie and candace if you guys have had moms who have come through your doors um who've experienced these so the idea here um for me in the way that i work with my moms and as well as uh what we do at jen's family therapy in our pandemic mamas group is really trying to normalize the experience of postpartum whatever it looks like for mama. And it could look very different from, for each of us. Um, and we started this group for uh, moms during the pandemic because postpartum was hard before. <laughs> it is a whole nother thing now. And it's the isolation is so much more the feelings of loneliness, you know, the village mentality that, um, you know, our community was lacking before is really diminished now because of the fact that we we can't sit. I mean, we're, we're hosting this virtually because we can't sit in the same room together yet. Um, and so that makes it a lot harder for our new moms to be able to feel connected and to be able to say like, hey, I'm having this experience. Like, are you having that same experience? Oh no, yours is completely different. Oh wow. The feelings of nor being, feeling like, oh, this is a normal experience. Um, it's nice, it's validating. And, uh, and unfortunately with the pandemic, we just haven't been able to have that the way that we're used to. And so we wanted to kind of create this for our mamas, um, a space to be able to come and, and join with other mamas who have babies who are, you know, who are born uh, either earlier on in the pandemic or during the pandemic, which then your pregnancy looked different. Your, um, 
your, your labor and your birth looked completely different than what you had imagined it to be. And so we wanted to create a safe space for moms to come and share a lot of those experiences with other moms um, and to get that support. Um, next slide. Thank you. So I just wanted to highlight um, the positive and the negative emotions that may flood a mama's body postpartum. So some of the things that come up is perfectly normal for you to have both positive and negative emotions about how you choose to feed your baby. Really, um, oh, there's, a, there's a lot of pressure on moms and there's a lot of feelings of inadequacy that can come up, a lot of perhaps prior I'm not enough feelings that can kind of come in here and linger and really um, create a lot of shame and guilt. And depending on the social support that may or may not be around mama, it may exaggerate those experiences when it comes to feeding our babies. And then um, perfectly normal to feel both positive and negative emotions about your relationship with your baby. For some mamas, that first initial like glowy moment it's not there and that's okay. And it's okay to take time to bond with your baby. And sometimes it takes longer for some moms and that's okay too. Um, we wanna be able to, to, to let moms know it, some, for some mamas it takes time and that's okay. Um, positive and negative emotions about your new role as a mother. I mean, this is a complete identity shift now. You have now this additional role that you play in your life that you didn't play before, you know, you, you delivered that child. You didn't really play it while you were pregnant either because this, this little human wasn't out and needing you to be there for them in that way. And so it's okay to have like great feelings of like, that this is the best thing. And also like, gosh, I really miss being able to like get up and go whenever I want. So we want to be able to normalize those experiences for moms as well. Um, missing your life before baby, again, it's a complete shift. And even more so during the pandemic, um, the freedom to get up and go is already kind of capped. And now you have a baby. And so it's even more capped. And so you're like, you know, it's like one of those Russian dolls. You're just like right in the middle and there's all these layers <laughs> around you. And it just feels like, gosh, I just missed the life that I had. And that doesn't mean that you don't love your baby. And that doesn't mean, you know, you, you want to get rid of your baby or it could bring up those feelings. And so we want to be able to support moms if those things come up because you don't have to do this alone. And then your new body. Whoa, what just happened? You created life and then you kind of brought it into the world and now you're left with kind of the, the vessel behind. And so what, you know, all the, the, the feelings of gratitude for the body to be able to create this, you know, little human. And also, goodness, this thing has just like ravished me. <laughs> so being able to, to talk about that in a safe space is really important as well. Um, in the next slide, cue Ramona, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, there's just some statements that some moms will have um, in their, you know, some thoughts and some statements that they'll say to themselves that really feel isolating and maybe they don't want to share out loud. And I'm just kind of curious, I want to open up to the floor, um, kind of have a discussion of some of the ways that you guys have normalized these feelings for some of the moms. Um, and just like what your thoughts are, I guess, on some of these statements. For example, um, I have no idea what I'm doing as a mother because mothering doesn't come with a manual um, or another one that I feel like comes up for some moms um, is I can't tell anyone what I'm thinking or feeling. They might look at me um, or uh, lock me up, label me as crazy, mm -hmm. unfit to be a mother. Um, so they, these moms go without sharing their thoughts and their feelings. And often that will exaggerate some of those thoughts and feelings. And then create some sort, you know, some situations that we want to be able to, to prevent. Great questions. So you oftentimes hear me say, I wish that we had Huggies commercials that were more reality based, right? So <laughs> Huggies commercial, there's this happy yeah. mom, you know, in this great clean house, but that's not reality. Right. Mm -hmm. So we need to create messages that having a baby, having a family um, can be very chaotic at times. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't I think a lot. It's like uh, alligator 
trying to be trapped, trying to get a diaper on them while they run away and they decide that that's the time that they're going to pee. What? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Lori, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, I think that um, especially moms are expecting and they're imagining what motherhood's going to be like. There can often be a lot of unrealistic expectations that they place on themselves. And then they're faced with the reality of what it really feels like to be pregnant and going through delivery and there could be some birth trauma and, you know, all mm -hmm. kinds of things can happen where, yes. you know, they're not bonding with the baby the way they want to be, or they, or they just feel like no emotion, not positive, not negative, just nothing. Mm -hmm. And then later they're grieving, like I should have felt this and I should have done that. And, you know, helping them say, you know, where you're at and what you're going through is okay you know mm -hmm. it's not going to feel this way long term you know you didn't have a baby and it turned you into some kind of you know bipolar crazy woman it's like normalizing and, and helping them understand what what they can do with their expectations to make them more reasonable for themselves and give themselves a lot of grace you mm -hmm. know as they're doing the best they can as a mom I mean again having a baby doesn't come with a manual. I mean, you can read yeah. books like what to expect when you're expecting and all kinds of things. But again, everybody's experience is unique and hopefully they will give themselves a lot more grace as will people around them, you know, to just kind of figure it out as they go, you know, and to reach out for help when they need it. Reach out for that support from friends and family and professionals like ourselves. Yeah, just to kind of piggyback what Lori's saying, you know, when we think about grief, we think oftentimes about death, but what about grieving what Lori said, you know, the loss of hopes and dreams. Um, mm -hmm. that, um, this journey would look a certain way and it doesn't. Um, I remember when I was having my oldest child, this will date me, but um, I was my oldest, um, I was pregnant when Rachel on Friends was pregnant, you know, when she was having her baby. So everything that I imagined including the way I would look, um, you know, from watching Friends, you know, I mean, it's silly, um, I'm sure, but I think that's what I think of when I think of loss of hopes and dreams, that's, that's how I imagine things would be, and, and these expectations didn't happen, like you're saying, Lori, um, you know, I had to grieve, well, I, that's not what my experience is going to be, and that's okay, that's okay, um, but we don't often think about grief in that way. Good point, yeah, I think, and, and it's really interesting um, how grief in, it's not something that's discussed, this, this concept of grieving once I, you know, once I become a mother, um, but you are grieving a lot of the expectations that you had that were unmet, and as well as grieving the loss of the person that you were pre this, because that person, um, has changed, right? You, mm -hmm. You've changed, you're now, you have this new additional role. I have this like thing in my head where like, once you're postpartum, you are always postpartum. Mm -hmm. You know, there is no going back there. There's no prepartum to this. Like mm -hmm. we're on the journey the other way. Um, and it's constantly changing. So the, the, it's not just like, oh, I had a baby. It's like, oh, I had a baby. Now I have, you know, I have an infant. Now I have a toddler and now I have a child and now I have a preteen and now I have a teen and now I have an adult child. So there's this lifespan of being a, a postpartum mom and what that looks like. And it's constantly changing, right? It couldn't just stay the same the whole time. It's going to be shifting and moving and to be able to go um, and, and share a space with other moms to be able to get some of that uh, validation and feel like oh wow like what i'm experiencing you know it's not uncommon there are other you know women out there that have the similar thoughts or similar feelings and so now i don't feel so alone and i can share some of these scary thoughts that i'm having in a space where i'm not going to be called crazy and i'm not going to be locked up um someone's not going to look at me as an unfit mo fit mother i'm not going to be judged um, I'm just going to have a space to be able to say these things out loud and someone to say like, I hear you, I see you, I'm, I'm here. And so I feel like with the pandemic, we haven't had the ability to have, you know, those circles and those spaces and those mommy and me's and those classes, um, you know, those things were just not as available or even like the pre having your baby, the classes that you would take, right. To get you prepared for 
those were all virtual and you may have had the idea that you would go and it would be this thing and you you know you see these things in the movies right you see the the deep breathing and the you know they take these classes and they're in all these positions and you just may not have had that because of you know the situation we're in and then feeling like you have you know you lost some of that you know it's it's hard I think too, Tamar, that um, we see this a lot with teen moms, you know, they're, they're not done being a teenager. And yet all of a sudden they have this baby to take care of. And that, that feeling torn between wanting to go and live the rest of my teen years and have fun and do all these things, but yet I've got this baby to take care of. And, And that internal struggle and feeling forced into a role that maybe they weren't yet ready to take on. And And yet, like you say, there's no going back. And so trying to find a balance between, yeah, I'm still a teen, but I'm also a mom. And do I, is there any place that I fit? Because I don't feel quite ready to be a mom, but I am one. I still want to go have fun with my friends and be a teen, but I can't because I've got this baby with me all the time. So where do I fit? Where's my place? You know, how do I how do I continue to live my life? Or do I just say, well, I guess I just miss out and grieve that and move forward. Yeah. And I would say that that's not even just for teen moms, right? Just, you know, having this addition to the family Um, Mm -hmm. and you could have had, you know, other children, right? But just Mm -hmm. those changes, you know, taking the baby to, you know, maybe an older child soccer practice or Mm -hmm. going out to dinner with this baby or what have you. Um, it changes the dynamics. Yeah, definitely. Um, and one of the one of the things that um, has come up or comes up is this idea of like, you know, I love my baby, I love my baby, but I've lost so much of who I am. I, you know, I or or why am I crying all the time, or why do I feel so like, why do I have so much rage? You know, I, and often you will hear from the external world telling us, um, telling moms and this idea of like, oh, you should be happy. This is the best time of your life. This is what you wanted. You wanted to have a baby Mm -hmm. and this is so great. And babies are so lovely. And, you know, this is the best thing that you could ever, you know, oh, you'll forget all of your birth trauma if you just look at your baby. And, but but that it's, I think it's changing the language, the way we speak to to postpartum moms um, is, is really necessary because we, you know, then we are just projecting our perspective on these moms who may not be experiencing that. And then them questioning, well, gosh, these people are telling me that I should feel this way, but I don't. So does that mean I'm an unfit mother? Does that mean I'm a horrible mother? You know, what does that mean about me? And so being able to change the language, I think is really crucial for the way we we talk to moms. And this is like, right, we're, you know, we're therapists and we, you know, we work with people on this level, but, you know, we aren't the only ones. And generally, we're sometimes the last ones that moms will come to. You have the doctors and the nurses and the nurse practitioners and all these other people who are seeing mom more consistently, um, who have more access um, to it, that they're not using the language, the supportive language, I guess, the wellness associated language um, that could potentially help moms get to us faster. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I believe that it's caught sooner than later, right? So I always yeah. think, you know, prevention. So that would be, you know, the wake office, that would be your lactation consultant, that would be your doula, your pediatrician. Um, because once you hit our office, um, then it's time to do work, right? So ideally, you know, mom builds community out in the community. Um, mm-hmm. so she doesn't have to come and seek services. But if you do, that's always an option. Yeah. And just to normalize all of the different ways that, you know, support looks so different for so many people. And we might have very organic, natural support systems, other moms, mm-hmm. um, you know, faith communities, um, work, our work environment. Um, but then sometimes we have to say, you know, I, I have some support needs that are, are not being met right now. And so I'm going to be proactive in finding that. That's why these forums are so fantastic is because educates the community about so many fantastic resources that are available to moms. We want you to know that you're not alone, um, that there is support there for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Candace, that's a great segue. Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> great. So you don't need to feel alone in this journey because it, this is, again, once you're postpartum, there's no going back. There's no prepartum to this. This is a journey. 
Um, there really isn't a destination. We're just here for the ride. Um, and you are a part of a larger community of women who either have felt, do feel, or will feel the exact same way that you feel right now. And so you don't have to be alone. And so our Pandemic Mamas uh, group is currently virtual and it's accepting new clients. So if you guys would you know, know anyone or you feel like you yourself need um, some extra support, reach out um, to Jan's Family Therapy. We'd love to have you. Thank you. That's a great presentation tomorrow. So up next, um, we are going to shift into infant loss, and that's going to be Candice. So Candice, does Ramona have your slides as well? Um, I um, emailed them, I believe, yesterday, but I had stepped out for a moment. I don't, we didn't practice that before, so I don't know. <laughs> Candice, do you need me to pull them up if I have them? Yeah, um, yes, I'm happy to screen share as well. I'm, I'm, I'm happy let to me, screen share. Let me, yes, I'll give you access to screen share. Okay, okay, perf. Awesome. There we go. Thank you. Okay, and so ladies, can you see my, my screen okay? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Thanks, thanks for that feedback. Um, so yeah, we wanted to take some time today just to talk about um, infant loss and um, our Angel Babies program, talking about support and resources in our community and just making sure that um, you know that this is available to you. Um, some people are familiar with our program and, and some people have not heard of it. Um, the Angel Babies is a program that provides support to families whose babies have died in pregnancy or in infancy. And this is a program of Heinz Hospice. Our mission is to provide comfort, to support, and uphold the dignity of families whose babies have either a life-limiting condition or whose babies have died. Um, one of the things that it's so important to do is just to really normalize in infant loss, in, uh, in a death that occurs, whether it's in pregnancy or in infancy, that this is a significant life for parents and families. And, um, I love this a picture. I love this saying, I carried you every second of your life and I will love you every second of mine. It's really important that we as a community support grieving parents. And this is a marginalized loss. This is uh, something that we may not know other people in our lives who have had this happen to them. And so it's important for you to know that you're not alone um, and that your, your baby is remembered. Um, and I'll go back to that slide in just a second, but I would say to you in, in the seven years that I've been doing this work, that this is just a very natural, um, you know, learning for me from parents. As a grieving parent, um, we want to know that we are not alone and that our baby is remembered. And so again, in providing that support, we wanna help you do that here at Angel Babies. And, and the rest, ladies, um, interrupt me if you have any questions or any thoughts, you know, as I continue on this. Um, but in our grief as parents, we have unique needs. And so um, I'll, I'm not gonna read through every single um, item here. We can just kind of talk about it a little bit, but it really just goes to, speaks to, um, that it takes time to acknowledge the reality of, of the death of our baby. And um, no matter where we are in our pregnancy, or if this is a, a death in the first years um, of baby, months, years of baby's life, um, but it's, it's really a time, um, it takes time for us to, for the, that to sink in. There's trauma involved, there's shock involved. And um, we want to really just remind you that you have time to do that. Um, we're going to talk about what happens when we're having pregnancy after a loss as well um, as the presentation goes on. But it's, it takes time for us to be able to accept the reality. And, and that's, that's normal. It can feel very um, unreal that this has happened to us. We talked about loss of hopes and dreams in all different aspects of being a mother. And especially when there's a death. Um, I imagined that my pregnancy would go this way or would be this way and my experience would be this way. And then when we experience the death of a baby, it's very devastating. Um, we feel alone. We may not have a strong support system and, and our, doesn't mean that our families don't love us and support us and care about us. They just oftentimes don't know how. And so part of our program is 
you know, peer support, connecting you with other moms who have had a similar experience so that you know that you are not alone. Um, it can take time to embrace the pain. Um, and, and what does that look like? Do I have time to grieve my child? Am I going back to work? Um, am I in circumstances where I have other children in my home? I'm, I'm um, caring for others. Maybe I'm caregiving for other family members outside of my household, right? So it can be very complicated to, to be in this place of grief, but then also trying to, and have that grief experience, but then also all of the other practical parts of our lives that occur. Um, we know that it's important to remember our babies. And so we, at Angel Babies, we provide opportunities to do that. We encourage you to find ways that are unique for you and your family to do that. Um, I'll share just a little bit. We just had our, um, our annual Angel Babies walk run just last weekend, and we do that annually. It's a time for families to join together and to remember their child, to, to um, you know, just again, recognize the fact that we're not alone in our grief. We do um, a time to remember event in the fall, in October, which is near National Infant and Pregnancy Loss Month. And so, of course, because of the pandemic, we talked about that earlier, you know, that isolation in our grief has been so difficult for so many. We haven't been able to gather like we have in the past, and that's been difficult. Um, so our goal is to, to hopefully be able to do that in the fall. We do a butterfly release um, and have special music and um, just a time again to gather. So we, we hope that, um, that you can make it. If that's, this applies to anyone who's listening today, you're invited. Um, we've talked about being a role, our role as mother, um, developing a new identity. What does that mean for me if my baby dies? You know, am I still a mom? And of course the answer is yes, but sometimes it, it's easy for me to say that, but it may not feel like that. And so surrounding you with support so that we can, um, you know, really just encourage you um, in that role. What does that look like for me? We search for meaning. Why has this happened? Um, and then also receiving that ongoing support from others. One of the things I want to make sure and just chat about briefly is um, you may be here today and you may um, have experienced a loss in the past and, and maybe you are now in pregnancy after loss. That can bring up so many different unique feelings. Um, I'm happy about this, this baby that's coming, but I also have a lot of fears, a lot of anxieties. And how do I reconcile all of that? Um, I might have feelings about um, the sex of my baby. And if I have a baby that died, that was a boy or girl, do I want a boy or girl next? Um, and, and there's all sorts of complex feelings about that. And, and we really normalize and validate that for all sorts of different reasons. Um, so what I wanna do is make sure that you know that we offer at Angel Babies a pregnancy after loss support group. And we meet monthly, we've been doing that on Zoom. Um, this could be a group where someone may want to attend once and really get that support they need. Sometimes people come back and want several um, group meetings. Of course, it's kind of a, a limited time span because of you know, the time of pregnancy, um, but we just encourage you to reach out. You can call me anytime to talk about this group. Um, I will let you know that we have one of our Angel Babies moms who's, a, um, she's on our staff, but she's also peer support. And so she actually leads this group and just does a fantastic job. Um, she's many, many years out in her grief. And so she can offer really a unique type of support. Um, I found this little um, image yesterday and just thinking, you know, um, yes, we are thrilled and excited about our baby, but we're also missing our baby that died and just really wanting to normalize that. Um, we have a whole bunch of different services available. Um, you can reach us online at heinzhospice.org if you're ever interested. This is just kind of a comprehensive list of all of the things that we have going on. Individual counseling for grief support for families, couples, children, teens. We have um, support calls and mailings that we offer. We have an understanding grief workshop online. You can access this just by going to the heinzhospice.org website and it's readily available to you. Um, so I'll stop the screen share now and I know we can just kind of have a discussion about the topic, but um, also make sure and like our Facebook page too, because we have a lot of info there. But um, I think just to really validate, you know, each person's unique grief, um, to normalize that. And then as we're doing today, to encourage the reach out for support. Candice, can you speak to um, siblings? So, you know, mom's mm -hmm. pregnant, 
we went to the hospital to have the baby, but mom comes home and explains to the other children within the home that the, that the baby has passed. Can you speak to maybe services you offer? And just yeah, like yeah. Thanks for that, Alex. And we know that that this loss really impacts everyone in the home and then extended family. Um, I had a, a conversation with someone recently about the Mother's Day holiday and what's normally a gathering um, for everyone in the family to celebrate maybe the matriarch of the family, you know, um, it's just not the same when there's a grieving member of the family and maybe a recent death of a baby. So um, just to really, you know, acknowledge that, um, but yes, children in the home and how do we explain what's happened to the baby to the children? We, of course, we encourage um, honest, open talk, developmentally appropriate for the age of the child in the home. Um, and just making sure that you all know that we do have extensive services for children and teens, whether it's a children's support group or a teen support group or individual counseling. We have a children's counselor here at the Center for Grief and Healing. Um, our Circle of Friends program for children ages three to 12 is phenomenal. It's an evidence-based practice program that pairs every child who's in the grief support program with a, what we call a special friend. So it's a teen volunteer age 14 to 24 who's had special training in grief. Um, of course, they're not doing therapy with the children. They're just doing play. And we know that through play, um, children often express their feelings and there's grief topics weekly so we have that available. Um, and then of course, teen support, which we're doing virtually right now on Monday afternoons. That, that group I'm actually very happy to report has just changed from a closed group to an open group. So that will be ongoing every Monday from four to five, um, drop in at any time. What we know about teens is sometimes they're busy. Sometimes they can, um, you know, can join us once. Sometimes they wanna come, you know, dozens of times. So we're gonna just really trust them to to come and attend when it when it works for them and when it feels helpful for them but yeah we want to meet the needs of the whole family for sure so i'm going to ask you one more question um so when we talk about infant loss we oftentimes think um, of a mom who's pregnant maybe lost the baby at you know first trimester second trimester but let's discuss also um, abortions and how that can impact you later on your second pregnancy sure yeah yeah and i think you know um, that as we've talked about, grief and loss is really about, um, um, it's, it's unique for each person, no matter where they're at in their, their journey, um, I would say as a woman. And, um, you know, if there's unique feelings about that, um, please still reach out for support. Um, we want to, again, normalize and validate and maybe, um, you know, the feelings in, in a pregnancy after an abortion, I, maybe I haven't had these feelings before. These are new um, and that's okay. It's okay. Well, what is that like for you now? And, and let's, um, you know, just kind of be there with, with a person who's having those feelings that they may not have had before. Um, I don't know, Alex, is that answering your question? Um, yeah. So I oftentimes think that women who, who have either had an abortion at some point and then experiencing some anxiety you know, moving forward, yeah. mm -hmm. or women who are experienced loss from infertility, right? So I feel like that they don't seek out services because they feel like they're a different population, mm -hmm. which that is not necessarily true because right. there was still a baby, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. And so how do we connect them back to us or yeah. to a clinician that specializes in that? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think just, um, you know, for any person that feels like, you know, I need support at this time, no matter what the circumstances were, are in my life or have been, um, there is a place for you. And it might be angel babies. It might be someone else. I, you know, there's so many different people represented here, um, but there is support. And it's so important to have that good mental health um, for any woman or mother and in pregnancy, after pregnancy. Um, and we, we want to be there for people. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything to add tomorrow, Lori? I would just say, Alex, that um, we often also um, provide support uh, for women who have lost babies and either during pregnancy or after pregnancy. And, you know, they just need a space that is not friends and family to be able to kind of work through those feelings, you know, and, and help them, you know, normalize some of the things they're going through and help them not feel 
so alone when they, you know, everyone in a family grieves differently when there's a loss, you know, and being able to, to process that with them. And so um, part of their wellness, you know, and is just being able to say, you know, how can we help you walk alongside you through this grief, through this journey, so that you can feel like you can move forward in your life and not get stuck in grief, you know, and because that can impact every member of the family, you know, when a mom gets stuck in grief um, mm -hmm. and it makes it really hard for people to move forward and have, have a life that they really would like to have. Um, so I, I think being able to do that, whether you go through uh, Candace's program, whether you come here, whether you, you know, go with Tamar or whether you meet with uh, many other providers available in our community, you know, mm -hmm. to walk alongside these moms and their families. Um, it's so important just to reach out and say, hey, I need some support. And sometimes that takes so much courage and it's so hard to do because there's that expectation of I should be able to handle this, mm -hmm. you know, but when you're you're trying to handle that and perhaps you've got other children in the home and you've got, you know, yeah. a, a spouse or a boyfriend or a partner in the home and you're trying to move through all those things. It just becomes a little too much, you know, and can cause, you know, some people to, to think about even not wanting to be here themselves, you know, and wanting to, wanting to be with that baby that they lost because that would be so much easier, you know? Yeah, Lori, I was, I'm going to kind of just piggyback on that too, because I want to just take a minute to talk about no timelines in grief. Um, and there might be some people watching today, tuning in who, you know, maybe their loss happened many years ago and they didn't get the support that they needed at that time. You know, it's, there's, there's no time like the present. Um, there's, there's no timeline with grief and also we have things that trigger us and, you know, come up for us. Um, but I think that can be really helpful to, to just remind ourselves that, um, you know, any time is a good time to offer support if you're needed. Yeah. Mar, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, Lori, when you said um, stuck, it really kind of resonated with just the work that we do, right? So, you know, one of the things that that I've realized in working with moms is if we don't, and and just working with people in general, right? When it, when we're talking about mental health. Um, when it's, I heard this quote from a podcast. I don't remember what podcast it was, so I don't know if I can quote it, but they said something about if it's, if you're hysterical, it's historical. Mm -hmm. And th that con that, that um, quote alongside what you just said, Lori, this idea of like, when we get stuck and we may not know necessarily like that we're getting stuck, like Candace, you said, people who have loss, who, who maybe didn't grieve it, um, didn't allow for it to kind of, you know, cycle its way through. Um, it festers and it sits somewhere in our body. And then years later, it comes out like a ravishing monster. And we have no idea where this is coming from, why we're experiencing this. And then it's so, it takes us a lot longer to link it back to the source. Mm -hmm. um, so when Lori, when you said stuck, I was like, oh my gosh, yes, this is like, that's the whole concept here is like helping, you know, helping moms, whatever that looks like, whatever um, momming looks like to get unstuck, um, mm -hmm. to normalize these experiences so that they don't years later come Mother's Day or come something, come an anniversary of a loss or something. They're experiencing all these emotions and they're like, I don't know why I get sick around this time every year. Well, maybe because we didn't talk about it when we needed to. Like, let's open up the discussion. Let's talk about it. Let's get kind of the raw, real and really painful things out there. Because if we don't allow these emotions to cycle themselves through, they're getting stuck somewhere in our body. And then they are, you know, eating away at us as we are, you know, aging. Yeah, that was so well said. Um, so it brings up two thoughts for me as one, you know, when mothers have children, sometimes um, they you know, re-process uh, their childhood, right? And so that kind of comes up for women um, and families, even partners, um, husbands, mm -hmm. right? And even older children within the home mm -hmm. um, that kind of plays out, you know, there's this new person in the home and how does that kind of change the system? Um, but then my second thought is grieving and grieving. And so, so there's this message that breastfeeding is easy, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't think throughout this whole series in May, we're going to talk about breastfeeding and 
uh, maternal wellness. Now, I always take it from a lens of mental health because that's what I do in life. Um, but breastfeeding in general can cause anxiety, right? If that's something that society is pushing on us, um, if that's something we plan to do because we felt that that was best for our baby, mm -hmm. and then it does not go as planned, right? Yeah. And then we know that if a mom is more anxious, what happens to her milk supply? Mm -hmm. Races, right? So there's just this horrible cycle um, that women go through, right? So if anybody wants to speak to breastfeeding um, and mental wellness, that's great. Yeah, um, I can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I think, that, and this is just a personal experience. And then also like the experience of I've heard from friends and other moms who have breastfed, there is this um, breast is best expectation. Mm -hmm. um, and I had that in the back of my mind when I had my daughter and there was a lot, a lot of pressure from external, um, the external family, as well as my own really, and I don't, I don't know where I got those, right? I, I mean, where, where was I fed all of this information that if I'm not breastfeeding my child, then I am, they are doomed for life. <laughs> um, when we know that's not true, there are plenty of babies who have survived and have thrived based off of, you know, eating just like foods in general, like the stories I've heard from older women, it's just amazing to me that how resilient babies are, but the pressure and, um, and also we don't get to choose our bodies. Uh, mm -hmm. And we don't get to choose how our breastfeeding journey is going to go. Um, and I've learned so much more about breasts than I ever thought I was going to. Um, and there, I, and I even, I even took a breastfeeding course prior to having uh, my daughter and it did not at all prepare me for what breastfeeding was actually going to look like. Um, I have a really good friend who um, had her daughter a couple months after me and she described it so beautifully. She said, I walked out of the nursery topless. My hair was sweaty. I was sweating and I just looked like I came out of like, you know, the, uh, the rainforest because yes. that's literally what it looks like. It's not, it, 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 cause it's hot. It's sweaty. You've got another, you've got a baby against your body. You know, they're trying to latch on. Sometimes, you know, there's a tongue tie. Sometimes they don't know how to latch. Sometimes, you know, what you're eating is causing, you know, your breast milk to, cause them to be colicky and gassy. And so it's the biggest guessing game I've ever played in my life. Um, so Alex, when you said it, like this, this image that we have of like, you know, the mom and she's glowing and she looks so great. And there's the baby who's latched on perfectly. And, you know, the baby is only breastfed. It's an image that's being told to moms that, but the reality of it is that's not how it looks. No. Uh, it often looks like we come out of the Amazon and it's hot and it's sweaty and your, you know, and your nipples hurt for a couple of weeks. The adjustment of feeling engorged can be really painful for some women, depending on the size of the breast. Mm -hmm. um, clogged ducts can be the most crucial pain I've ever experienced. And then some women who are very, very lucky get mastitis, which I also experienced. And so it, it, the mental wellness is, and the, and breastfeeding, it, goes hand in hand because the anxiety and the pressure and the expectations mm -hmm. um, really weigh heavily on the guilt and the shame and the embarrassment and the frustration that comes with either the feelings of I can't do this or I don't want to do this. Um, mm -hmm. so there's a lot that goes into breastfeeding that is so important for mom's mental wellness too. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like, um, you know, we talk about how every birth experience is different, right? Mm -hmm. We also need to piggyback that with every breastfeeding experience is different. Um, I have four kids and two of them love to breastfeed. One I had to like pull off at almost five. And then I have two more that are like, no, 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 right? And so every child is just completely different. And so again, moms tend to blame themselves, but mm -hmm. really, you know, it's not are just us, right? It's yeah. how, the baby, as you mm -hmm. spoke, how the baby's mouth um, is formed and, you know, just the attitude and temper of the baby as well. It's, yeah, and Alex, you know, what came to my mind too is thinking about like how, you know, we're talking about one part, you know, breastfeeding, we're talking about one, one piece of this journey. And what if we throw in, you know, mom's grieving, right. 
kind of my lens, you know, my lens is the grief. And so mom's grieving and she's trying to do the breastfeeding. And then I always say, oh, and by the way, who's going to get groceries or the laundry to do, right? So there's like, or I, and I'm figuring out going back to work or all those things. And so if nothing else, just to say, just to validate to anybody who's watching today, it's, you have a big job. There's a lot going on and we can't do it by ourselves all the time. We need support. And um, you're not alone. I would like to just add to uh, uh, that it's important when, you know, whether it's breastfeeding or whether it's another area of grief where we're feeling stuck, that we have to be courageous enough to give ourselves permission to heal and not feel guilty for mm -hmm. letting ourselves heal over a loss that we've had, um, you know, in this process of, of motherhood. Um, whether it's, you know, losing an infant or whether it's losing some other um, part of ourselves, but saying uh, it's okay and I'm not dishonoring uh, my baby, you know, if I give myself permission to heal, you know, permission to say, I'm not doing very well and, and I do need some support and I don't know how to heal myself, you know, and so for everybody listening out there, I just want to say, you know, be kind to yourself and give yourself permission to heal. So well said. So thank you, ladies. Again, um, I am Alexandra from California Health Collaborative. Um, you guys can Google that if you guys would like to receive services. We have Tamar from Jan's Family Therapy and Private Practice. Um, we have Candice from Heinz Hospice. And we have Lori from County Behavioral Health Perinatal Unit. So thank you so much for joining us. And we will see you again tomorrow at noon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.